It was 1979 when my parents bought the brand new Sharpie permanent marker. And while they warned my brother and I about the permanence of that pen's ink, their warning to me sounded more like an invitation. It was an invitation which was beckoning me to prank my brother while he was sleeping. And with that, let's just say that he was the only 11-year-old who woke up the next day with a full mustache. Now, you can only imagine how disappointed I was when I discovered that a permanent marker isn't as permanent as the name would lead us to believe. And just with a few hours of scrubbing, that mustache was gone. For the sake of clarity, I should point out that the word permanent, it refers to that which is persistent and perpetual. The word permanent also points to that which is endless, eternal, and everlasting. And as we consider the meaning of this word, I'm happy to tell you that there are many things that are called permanent, but actually aren't. For example, the ink in a Sharpie pen, not as permanent as they would have you to believe. Another example of this can be found in the popular hairstyle, which was back in the 70s, known as a permanent wave. Now, if you were a victim of disco fashion during that period of time, then the chances are you ended up getting what was commonly called a perm or a permanent wave. And and if so, then I'm guessing at this point in your life, you're looking back and you're relieved to know that a perm isn't as permanent as the name would lead us to believe. A more recent example of this can be found in cosmetics. and, And there is a cosmetic procedure commonly called permanent makeup. Now, just to be clear, permanent makeup is for those who would like to get a face tattoo, but don't want to look like you just got released from, from prison, you know? And, and, and so, so some ladies go out and get permanent makeup. And, and while it's true that a permanent makeup tattoo is one way to make sure that your eyebrows are always on fleek, I, I would also point out that permanent makeup applications will always last longer than modern makeup trends. And so if you are going to get permanent makeup, make sure that it's kind of a timeless look, you know, because chances are the makeup trends of today aren't going to be the same as the makeup trends of tomorrow. Now, one reason why I know this is not because I went and got permanent makeup on my face, but I I do have tattoos. I, I was once a stupid kid, in other words. I, and, I, and, you know, back in the late 80s and early 90s, I, I was excited to decorate my body with these permanent ink tattoos. And, and yet now here I am many years later, I'm almost 50 years old. And I have to be honest with you this morning, and I, and I must confess that I, that I am a bit embarrassed by the tattoos I received in my younger years. You see, the things that I thought were so cool, you know, back in my teens and 20s, I don't really think are that cool anymore, you know, and, and yet there they are. <laughs> yep, stuck with these tattoos. And, and you know, it, tat, these tattoos that I received are one reason, not every reason, but they are one reason why I don't wear tank tops. <laughs> Now, as I consider these permanent tattoos that I got, I'm glad to tell you that the word permanent isn't as permanent as it might sound in this case, because there is a permanent promise that God has made to every born again believer. God has promised to provide every believer with a brand new body in the resurrection. I look forward to that day when I can finally wear tank tops again. You see, when I receive my brand new body, I'm not going to have these embarrassing tattoos anymore. And so I look forward to these promises of God and I patiently wait for the promises of God. And as we make our way through the text, which is before us today, I'm happy to tell you, first of all, that God's promises are permanent because they're infallible. We'll also see that God's promises are permanent because they're immutable. And thirdly, and finally this morning, we'll see that God's promises are permanent because they are immovable. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6, because here we find Paul, he's reminding his Hebrew audience about the messianic prophecies and promises that God has given to us. And as you make your way to Hebrews 6, we should take a moment to put our text back into its context. And with this as our focus, it'll help you to remember that Paul spent the first 12 verses of this chapter encouraging the original recipients of this epistle to to repent of their spiritual sluggishness and to do this by refocusing their faith on the heavenly call of God, which is in Christ Jesus. 
He also directed them to become diligent disciples who are moving forward in faith. And the best way to do this, well, it's by following in the footsteps of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let's consider the way that Paul put it. Let's revisit the last two verses of our text from last week. If you would look with me there at Hebrews 6, beginning at verse 11. There he declares, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what? The promises. Here we find Paul encouraging the original recipients of this epistle by directing them to become diligent disciples who are imitating, or in other words, following in the footsteps of those who patiently serve our Savior by faith in the promises of God. And just to be clear, Paul pointed to Abraham as the example of one who is worthy of our imitation. As a matter of fact, if you would, let's continue making our way through Hebrews chapter 6. We'll pick up our study at verse 13. Here, Paul declares, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now here in these verses, we find Paul pointing to Abraham as a perfect picture of those who inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. But before we examine Abraham's example, I want to first point out that the Bible is actually filled with the promises of God. As a matter of fact, time would fail us this morning to recount all of the precious promises that God has given to us throughout his holy word. There are actually books dedicated to just listing the promises of God. The Bible is filled with promises that he's made to his people. And I would encourage every Christian to spend time studying the scriptures, looking for those promises. In this way, we can know the exceedingly great and precious promises which have been given to those who trust in Jesus. For now, though, I simply want to take some time to focus on the promises that the Lord made to Abraham. The first promise, well, it's found in Genesis chapter 12. It's there where the Lord called Abraham to leave the land that his family was from and to move to Canaan. And it was at that point in time when the Lord promised to make Abraham's name great in all the world. Not only that, but the Lord also promised to bless him by making him the father of a great nation. And then after promising to multiply his descendants, well, the Lord made a promise which affects every single person. And he did this by declaring, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now as we consider these incredible promises, the main problem in their fulfillment was found in the fact that Abraham's wife was barren. Not only that, but Abraham was 75 years old and childless when the Lord called them to leave the land of Mesopotamia. And I can only imagine how difficult it was for 75-year-old Abraham to believe that the Lord was actually going to fulfill this promise to make him the father of a great nation. And yet regardless of how impossible the promises of God seemed, Abraham responded with faith. Abraham believed God, which is why he packed up his family and headed for the land of promise. In this way, we can see that Abraham truly believed God and he truly believed that the promises of God are entirely trustworthy. So trustworthy that he could move his family all the way to Canaan, believing that God was going to make good on his promises. Now, I'm going to guess here this morning that we're all a little leery when it comes to the promises that people make to us. And while it's true that the most sincere person intends to keep the promises that they make, it's also true that we're all just humans and we're all fallible and we're all forced to face unforeseen circumstances which could keep us from fulfilling our promises. And so with all humility, we would do well as individuals to prayerfully consider uh, what the Lord's will is for our life before making promises that we won't be able to keep. We shouldn't rush into making promises but we should be prayerful and humble, realizing that broken promises are, are difficult for people 
on the re- receiving end. You know, the, uh, you know broken promises, they, they lead to broken relationships. I like the way that Solomon put it in Proverbs 25 where he tells us that broken promises are worse than rain clouds that don't bring rain. And listen, if you're a farmer and you see the rain clouds coming and you're like, yes, you know, finally some rain for the crops and, and all of a sudden these rain clouds blow through, but no rain. It's like, oh, the cloud was a promise of rain, but it was a broken promise. It's disappointing. And when we break our promises to others, I mean, you know, they're disappointed and hurt and oftentimes relationships are destroyed by broken promises for this reason that I'm always a little leery of the promises that people make and I I must confess that my suspicions increase the very second the person seeks to establish their sincerity by swearing on something uh, like a stack of Bibles. Have you ever heard anybody swearing on a stack of Bibles? Like is not one Bible good enough? I mean why do you need a stack of Bibles right? You know but there they are I swear on a stack of Bibles and, and it creeps me out even more when they start swearing you know by deceased relatives or or their children that's the worst to me it's just kind of like I swear on my child's life it's like don't do that because you don't know if you're going to be able to keep that promise and there you are swearing by the life of your child now I realize that they're just attempting to establish their own integrity they're, they're trying to show their sincerity that they really intend to keep the promise and yet all they're doing for me, they're, they're, they're presenting me with the proof that their promises aren't entirely trustworthy and they know it themselves. You see, the person who always keeps their promise can simply swear by their own name. A person who tends to keep their promise can just say, hey, you know, you know my word is good because I keep my promises, right? Right? It's for this reason that here we find God swearing by his own name. And in order to prove my point, let's look here at Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 13 again, where Paul tells us that when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Paul was reminding his readers that Abraham could believe the promises of God. And one reason why is based on the fact that God swore an oath in his own name. He swore by himself. And in light of this, we can see that God didn't need to swear on a stack of Bibles. The reason why is because he is the source and the standard of truth. Therefore, every promise he makes is completely, entirely trustworthy. This reminds me of something that the Lord revealed in the 23rd chapter of Numbers. It's verse 19 where we learn that God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken And will he not make it good? These rhetorical questions lead us to understand that if God makes a promise, you can count on it. You see, the Lord is not a fallible man who is unable to keep the promises that he makes. No, instead, the Lord is the infallible one who never fails to fulfill every promise. Therefore, we can follow in the footsteps of Abraham, believing every promise that the Lord has made. And with this as our focus, let's consider the way in which Abraham eventually obtained the promise of God as he moved forward in faith. And with this as our focus, let's take another look there at verse 13. Here again, Paul declares, for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now, Here we find Paul reminding his readers about the way that Abraham patiently waited for the promise of God. He patiently endured until he obtained the promise. And in order to put this patience into perspective, I'll remind you that Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. And it was 25 years later at the age of 100 when the Lord provided Abraham with his son Isaac. 25 years went by before the Lord provided him with Isaac. 25 years. Abraham patiently waited for the Lord to provide that promise. 25 years went by as Abraham Abraham held on to hope, believing that God would in fact fulfill that promise. Now, when we get to Hebrews chapter 11, which is commonly called the hall of faith, 
we're going to learn more about the way in which Abraham patiently waited for the Lord to fulfill the promises that he made. So I don't want to go into too much detail about it today. But for now, I would simply encourage every Christian to follow Abraham's example of faith. And we do this by patiently enduring every difficulty as we wait for the Lord to fulfill every promise that he's made. At the same time, it's important to understand that those who fail to believe that the promises of God are infallible, well, we're also going to find it more difficult to patiently endure as we wait to obtain the promises. In order to explain what I mean, let's continue to consider the example of Abraham, which Paul described in more detail in the book of Romans. If you would hold your place here in the book of Hebrews, and let's turn to the fourth chapter of Romans. Now, as you make your way to Romans 4, I want to take a moment to point out that the word infallible, when I talk about the infallible promises of God, the word infallible, it's used of those who are incapable of error. Infallibility is the quality of one who is unable to mislead another. Uh, An infallible person is unable to deceive or disappoint with broken promises. And listen, those who truly believe that the promises of God are infallible, well, we tend to have the faith of Abraham. I want to consider how Paul described Abraham's faith here in Romans chapter 4. If you would look with me, beginning at verse 18, here we learn that Abraham was a man who, contrary to hope, in other words, there was no reason for him to have hope in those promises, and so contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Now, in light of these verses, we can see that Abraham... He was fully convinced. He wasn't a little convinced. He wasn't almost convinced. He was fully convinced that God was able to fulfill all of his promises, though he was 100 years old and though uh, his wife had a barren womb. Abraham believed that the promises of God are infallible, without error. And so he knew that they would most certainly be fulfilled. It's for this reason that Abraham was strengthened in faith. He was strengthened in faith as he patiently endured every difficulty while waiting for the promises of God. And listen, according to Paul here, the infallible promise that God made to Abraham has been extended to us as well. The promise wasn't just made to Abraham, but also to all the families of the earth through Abraham. Remember, the Lord told Abraham that all the families of the earth would be blessed through his seed. And just to be clear, I want to point out that it's Galatians 3, verse 16, where Paul explains this promise in more detail by declaring, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, who is Christ. In other words, Abraham's son son Isaac wasn't the final fulfillment of the Lord's promise to Abraham. Oh, Abraham waited for 25 years before he received his firstborn son Isaac, but that wasn't the final fulfillment. That wasn't the seed who was promised. No, instead, Isaac went on to beget Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah, and Judah begot Perez. And, and in order to, to just sum this up, the bloodline continues all the way down to Mary, who was chosen to give birth to the promised seed, Christ Jesus our Lord. And listen, it was about 2,000 years that went by from the birth of Isaac to the coming of Christ. About 2,000 years before the Lord fulfilled the promise that he made to Abraham. And still yet, Abraham was fully convinced 
that the Lord would fulfill his promises because he knew that the promises of God are infallible. Now, as we consider Abraham's example, I would remind you of Paul's encouragement, which we find back in Hebrews 6, verse 12. It's back in verse 12 where he says, do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Don't become spiritually sluggish because you've waited for a year, you know, for God to fulfill some promise he made to you and a year has passed by and it's just kind of like, well, it's never going to happen then because I've waited a full year and, you know, wait a minute. I mean, Abraham waited for 25 years before Isaac came along and then it would be another 2000 years before the, the seed Christ Jesus came along. And yet Abraham continued to believe. This is the sort of patient faith that we ought to have. And the way we gain this sort of patient faith is by believing that the promises of God are completely infallible, entirely without error. We've been called to imitate the faith of Abraham who was fully convinced that the Lord would fulfill his promises. And while I realize that it's easy for us to become impatient as we wait on the promises of God, we must not fail to realize that our impatience with God will simply result in a lack of faith that causes us uh, to, to pursue many sinful you know, uh, mistakes along the way. When we grow weary in waiting on the promises of God, we start looking for other solutions. We start considering other options. And as a result, we make many sinful decisions. That being the case, it's important for us to learn how to be patient with God. We need to learn how to be patient with God by realizing that his timing is right. And mine? Not so much. I encourage every Christian to be patient and we do this by resting in the fact that the Lord is going to fulfill every promise, but he's going to do it within his perfect timing. He's not going to break one promise, but it's going to be according to his perfect timing. And with that, we can be patient. Listen, the infallibility of God's permanent promises, it'll fill our hearts with patience as we just trust in the fact that he's going to make good on every promise. Not only that, though, the immutability of God's permanent promises will also fill our hearts with great confidence. And in order to explain what I mean by this, let's continue to make our way through the book of Hebrews. We find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 6. And if you would, let's focus our attention beginning at verse 16. Because here Paul goes on to declare, for men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now, here in these verses, we find Paul, he's describing these two immutable things which prove that God is incapable of breaking his promises. And for the sake of clarity, it'll help you to know that this word immutable, it's found there in verses 17 and 18. It's translated from a Greek word which speaks of something that is fixed and therefore unchanging. That which is immutable is unchanging. Therefore, the promises of God are not only infallible, free from error, but they're infinitely infallible, meaning that they're fixed forever as unchangeable, immutable truths. With that being the case, I want to consider two immutable things that prove the unchangeability of God's promises. And if you would look with me again there at verse 16, because here Paul tells us that men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Now, based on this, we can see that men, uh, we attempt to prove our promises in two different ways. And, and, and the reason why is because, you know, promises can end up in disputes and, and, and you, know, uh, you know, someone wants to just, you know, settle the argument by just saying, okay, look, here's how I'm going to prove this promise. The first attempt to prove a promise usually occurs as the person swears by something greater. Like earlier, I talked about a stack of Bibles, but oftentimes it's, you know, in the name of God. I swear to God that I'm going to do this. Can't even tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, I swear to God I'm going to fulfill this promise. It's usually with a thumb out like this. I swear to God. No, I'm just, 
I'm not going to do political jokes this morning, but uh, people typically realize that the integrity of their name isn't enough to prove the promise. And so what do they do? They invoke the name of God. Then after swearing by the greater, they set out to confirm their promise with a solemn oath. And yet, I'm sure that we all realize that men are fallible. And not only are we fallible, not only are we, you know, capable of error, but our minds are also changeable. I think that we all recognize that, 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 that many of us have changed our minds, if not all of us. We've all changed our mind about something at some point in time. The minds of men can be changed, and one reason why is because we're able to learn. We're able to gain new information. And there are times when we make promises only to then afterwards discover new information which changes everything. And all of a sudden, we look at the promise that we previously made, and we realize, oh, we didn't have all the information when we made that promise. And now we've got this new information, and we're not so sure that we can keep the promise that we made because of this new information. And sometimes that information was withheld by the person we made the promise to. There are those, you know, who, you know, we're making promises to, and they've given us a little bit of the information, and then we find out later that they they were actually withholding information, and now we feel like, okay, we don't really have to keep this promise because they weren't really upfront about everything, and I've just learned some new information, so I don't mind breaking this promise. There, there are people who do things in that in that way, and then there are those who break their promises simply because they changed their mind along the way. They, 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 you know, all of a sudden they, they wanted something or they wanted to guarantee something and now they don't want it anymore and they changed their promise. Regardless of why though, I mean, you know, we, ch- we change our minds. We, we gain new information and all of a sudden the, the, the promises that we made, we no longer keep. And in light of all of these issues, I'm happy to tell you that the promises of God are immutable, they're unchanging, and the reason why is because, listen, he's the infinite God who already knows everything before the promise was made. We break promises sometimes because, you know, we end up learning new information. God will never learn new information. He is infinite in knowledge. He already knows everything, and therefore his promises are always yes and amen. He's not going to get to some day in, in the future and go, oh, well, I didn't know this was going to happen. And so this promise that I made, never going to happen that way. Now, as we consider the immutable nature of God and, and as we consider his infinite mind, I, I, I want to look again back at verse 13 because there again, uh, Paul declares, when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. He didn't swear on a stack of Bibles. You know, he, he swore by himself. The Lord proved the immutability of his promises as he swore by himself. And and in order to grasp how this proves the immutability of his promises, I'll remind you of something that the Lord revealed in Malachi 3, verse 6. It's there where he declares, For I am the Lord, I do not change. I love that. I am the Lord, I do not change. Which means... There's no reason for him to change his mind. Uh, he's not going to learn new information that, that, that causes him to break promises. James assures us of this fact by telling us that there is no variation or shadow of turning within the glorious light of the Lord. God is this pure light and there is no variation. There is no shadow of turning. There, 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 there is no day when God wakes up on the other side of the bed and decides, well, you know, I'm a different God today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And and when God swears by himself, he is guaranteeing his promise upon his unchanging nature. And as if that isn't enough, the Lord doubled down on his promise with an oath. And if you would look with me again at Hebrews 6, verse 17, there again, Paul declares, thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it with an oath. He's basically saying, look, if it's not enough for me to swear by my own name, and by my own immutable nature, I'm going to confirm this promise with an oath. That word oath refers to a pledge or a vow to keep a promise. In other words, it's a promise to keep a promise. 
God set out to prove the immutability of his promises by promising to keep his promises. And then in verse 18, Paul goes further and explains how this proves the immutability of God's promises because he reminds us here that it's impossible for God to lie. That's right, it's impossible for God to lie. And the reason why is because he is the truth. Now, we typically think about God as being this infinite being without limitation and, and to say, well, God can't do something. It's like, <gasps> whoa, 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 hold on a second. Don't put God in a box. Well, listen, Paul tells us right here that there is something that God can't do. He cannot lie. He cannot break his promises because he cannot go against his nature. God is the truth, and therefore it is impossible for God to lie. Not only that, but it's impossible for God to learn. And the reason why is because he is all-knowing. What this means then is that God already had all of the information before ever making a promise to us about providing us with a savior. Listen, God's not going to arrive at tomorrow and see you doing just the most, you know, ignorant thing you've ever done, the most sinful thing you've ever done and think, oh, well, pff, you know, I didn't know you were going to do that. Now this whole Jesus promise, I'm not so sure about. It's not going to happen. God already knew everything that you would ever do before he created the foundations of the earth and still decided to send a savior. Therefore, we can rest in the confidence of knowing that there will never be a reason for the Lord to break the promises he's made to us. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 18. Here again, Paul reminded his readers that God has confirmed his promises by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie so that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Paul is helping us Hebrew audience to understand that the immutability of God's promises have been proven by two immutable things, namely that he's made the promise upon his own and unchanging character. And then he confirmed it with this oath, a promise to, to, to keep the promise. And, and all of this ought to provide us with strong consolation. Those words, strong consolation can, can also be rendered powerful encouragement. I like the way that the scholars who gave us the new living translation render this verse. They put it like this. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. Simply put, those who trust in the promises of God can have great confidence because God's word is immutable, it's unchanging, and it's free from error. This was precisely the point that Paul was making in Titus chapter 1, verse 2. There he encourages Pastor Titus by declaring, the truth gives us confidence that we have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the world began. Before the world began, God made a promise to provide us with eternal life by faith in Jesus Christ. And now we can have confidence in this God who does not lie. Our hearts should be filled with great confidence in the immutable promises of God. And while it's true that the enemy of our souls will come along and they will whisper lies into our spiritual ears and they want us to question the promises of God. And, and, and listen, I'm here to tell you that the enemy works overtime trying to convince unbelievers that they're okay with God. And at the same time, the enemy works overtime trying to convince Christians that they are not okay with God. The enemy wants nothing more than to lie to the, to the child of God, the Christian, the born-again believer. The enemy wants to whisper into our ears and say, God won't forgive you for that one. The enemy of our souls wants to come along and convince us that we cannot simply rest in the refuge of God's immutable promises. With that being the case, I would encourage you 
don't listen to those lies, but rather take great confidence in the fact that God will never break the promises he's made to us in Christ Jesus. So we see then that the infallibility of God's permanent promises ought to fill our hearts with patience. And not only that, but the immutability of God's permanent promises will fill our hearts with confidence. Finally, we should consider how the immovability of God's permanent promises will fill our hearts with assurance. And in order to explain what I mean by this, let's continue to make our way through the book of Hebrews. We find ourselves again in Hebrews 6. We'll pick up our study here at verse 19, where Paul declares this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, here in the final verses of this chapter, we find Paul. He's returning the attention of his readers back to this topic of Melchizedek. And I want to remind you that, uh, you know, he's getting back to a point that he was previously making back in chapter 5. It was back in chapter 5 where Paul helped his Hebrew audience to understand that the Lord Jesus has become uh, the high priest of heaven. And, and, and he realized that his Hebrew audience would ask, well, I thought, the, I thought the high priest had to come from the tribe of Levi. And Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. So how can Jesus from the tribe of Judah fulfill this position that is fulfilled by Levi and his descendants? And, and knowing that this would be the question, Paul pointed in Hebrews 5, verse 6, he pointed them back to the 110th Psalm where King David tells us that the promised Messiah would be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, not according to the order of Levi, but according to a, a prior high priest named Melchizedek. And in Hebrews 5, verses 9 and 10, Paul reveals that the Lord Jesus has become the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Then in verse 11 of chapter 5, he informed the original recipients of this epistle that there was still much more to say about this connection between Melchizedek and our Messiah Jesus. Unfortunately, they were believers who had become dull of hearing, and that's what he told them. He says, hey, I got much more to say about this, but you can't hear it right now. And the reason why is because, remember, they were drifting away from the faith. They were loosed from their moorings, and, and they were beginning to turn their back on Jesus Christ. And, and so Paul brought them to this place of saying, hey, here's who Jesus is. He's this high priest according to this order of Melchizedek, and you can't hear this right now. And so I need to take you back to a refresher course on the elementary principles of the Christian faith. And that's how chapter 6 began, with this interruption of his discussion of Melchizedek. But now that he's given them that crash course back in verses 1 and 2, and now he's bringing them back to the topic of Melchizedek. And he was preparing their hearts so that they could grasp the incredible connection that we find between Christ Jesus, our Messiah, and Melchizedek. As we get to Hebrews chapter 7, we'll learn more about this mysterious man, Melchizedek. And as we examine everything that Paul had to say about Melchizedek, we'll gain a better understanding of the pre-incarnate identity of our Messiah, Jesus. But for now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I, I simply want to point out that the Lord Jesus is our high priest. And he's a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And he's proven the permanence of God's promises through his physical resurrection. That's what Paul is saying here in these verses. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me again there at verse 19, where Paul declares this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, in order to grasp what Paul is saying, it'll help you to know that the word veil here, it's translated from a Greek word which was used in reference to that thick temple curtain which would separate the holy place from the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And so Paul's saying, hey, Jesus has entered behind the veil. And yet it's important to understand that Jesus didn't go into the earthly holy of holies. With that, I'll remind you that the temple plans that the Lord gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, well, it was actually designed after the throne room of God, which is there in heaven. Therefore, when Paul tells us that the Lord Jesus has entered into the presence behind the veil, he's not talking about the earthly veil. 
He's talking about the heavenly veil. He's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ when Jesus entered the presence of God behind the veil. As a matter of fact, look with me again there in the middle of verse 19. Here again, Paul wrote about this hope which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. Now for the sake of clarity, Paul wasn't suggesting that the Lord Jesus drives a Toyota. And he's not suggesting that the only way to get to heaven is to go by a forerunner and drive there. No, the word forerunner here speaks of the one who runs ahead of the troops in order to prepare the way. They're the vanguard. They, they go in first and they make sure that, that the company of troops can, can get through safely. They're a spy that goes forward. They, they prepare the way. And so we see that Jesus is the forerunner because he already entered the Holy of Holies, which is located there in heaven. He's paved the way for us. And what this means is that his sacrifice for our sins has been accepted by our heavenly father. Because listen, if his sacrifice hadn't been sinless, he would have been rejected by the father. He would not have entered into the presence behind the veil. But because he has, because of his resurrection and ascension into heaven, we know that he's paved the way. And Paul is letting us know that those who follow Jesus by faith in his finished work, then we also will enter the presence of God behind the veil. And listen, this is an everlasting promise. It's an everlasting promise which will never change. And in order to prove my point, look with me again there at verse 19. There again, Paul tells us that this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become, notice, high priest for how long? forever, forever. Paul is helping his Hebrew audience to understand that this you know, turnover role of high priest, when they watch the, the human high priest come along and, and then this high priest would die and so another would take his place and, and these guys were only providing temporary atonement through, through these sacrificial animals. And Paul's gonna go into greater detail about all that in, in chapters to come, but, but for now, uh, it's just important to understand that Paul is saying, look, Jesus is high priest forever, never to be replaced. He will continue to serve as the high priest of heaven forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And listen, that word forever is translated from two Greek words which points to an everlasting span of time. A never ending point in time. Jesus will always be our high priest. The Lord Jesus is a permanent high priest and not permanent in, in, in the Sharpie pen sort of way, but truly permanent. He is our everlasting high priest who will never be removed and never be replaced. That being the case, those who trust in Jesus have real hope. We have a hope that is immovable because we have a savior who is immovable. This was precisely the point that Paul was making there in the beginning of verse 19 where he declares this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Now, it'll help you to remember that the Greek word translated hope, it refers to the assurance that comes from a joyful and confident expectation of something. Those who are hoping in the salvation of Jesus Christ, those who are hoping in the promises of God can have assurance in the confident expectation that God will fulfill those promises. And as we saw in our study last week, those who trust in Jesus enjoy this confidence of salvational assurance. Now here in our text this morning, we see that this blessed assurance of hope, it actually acts as an anchor for our soul. Incredible. That word anchor was translated from a Greek word, which was used in reference to a, a, a heavy iron device which had curved arms and flukes at the end and, and, and the anchor was typically tethered to the bow or the stern of the ship or sometimes both. And, and, and this was used for keeping the craft from drifting away. They would cast anchor and the flukes would dig into the ground and <laughs> the ship would stay in place. As we consider the way in which our hope in Jesus is designed to serve as an anchor for our souls, I would remind you that the original recipients of this epistle were failing to enjoy this steadfast security in the Lord. And, and, the, and the reason why is because they were drifting away. 
And so Paul's saying, look, don't drift away. Don't be carried away by every wind of doctrine. Don't be tossed to and fro by the spiritual storms of, 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 of dece- deception. To, but, but have this anchor, which is the hope that we have in the promises of God. This hope that gives us the confident expectation of salvation. Well, it, it remains in place by, by the anchor which is steadfast and sure. Now, it's possible that you're here this morning and, and, and you're struggling with spiritual drifting. If you're drifting away and, and, and you don't feel like you're just have the, walking in this steadfast assurance in the Lord Jesus Christ, I would remind you that those who embrace the assurance of God's promises will begin to have a heart that's filled with the assurance of hope. And according to Paul, this hope, which serves as a spiritual anchor for our souls, it's both sure and steadfast. Now, the word sure, which is found there in the middle of verse 19, was translated from a Greek word, which speaks of that which will not fail. It's a negative form of the word fail. And so fail not. The hope that we have in Christ does not fail. That word can also be rendered certain and true, and therefore Paul is essentially saying the hope that we have in Jesus, it will never fail because it is certain and it is true. I should also point out that the Greek word, which is translated steadfast, it finds its Greek, uh, its root word in, in the Greek word basis. I'm sure we all use this word basis. The word basis speaks of an underlying support which provides a firm and fixed foundation which cannot be moved. And what this means then is that the hope that we have in Jesus, it provides us with this firm and fixed foundation. And the reason why is because the permanent promises of God are much like an immovable anchor. They keep us in place. And as an immovable anchor, the hope of salvation, it should fill our hearts with full assurance even until the end of our life. Now, it's possible that you're a believer who has become discouraged over broken promises or, or unfulfilled promises. Maybe, maybe you're a believer who is discouraged by the broken promises of someone that you know, and, and you don't know why God would allow someone to make all these promises to you and, and then not keep them. Or, or maybe you're just a Christian who, who is struggling with the, the, the idea that, that God hasn't yet fulfilled promises that you feel like, like he's made to you, and, 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 and you've become impatient in waiting You know, we live in this society that has trained us to be impatient. We've been raised to think that anything that we want, we should be able to get it right now. And we think that because somebody has made a promise to us that it should be, you know, it should happen now. And so it's easy to become impatient. with that being the case, I would just simply remind you that the Lord always keeps his promises, but that doesn't mean he keeps them in the timing that we would like. Sadly, though, it's easy to find ourselves discouraged and struggling, wrestling, wondering why God is allowing this to continue or why he hasn't solved that or or when is he going to fulfill this promise that he's made. And we can wrestle and we can struggle and wonder and lose hope and begin to drift. And if this sounds like you, then I would remind you that the Lord is the only one who is able to keep all of his promises. And it's not just that he's able to, because I'm sure that we all know someone who was able to keep a promise, but then just didn't. Oh, those people frustrate me more than any other. Because I can understand someone who made a promise, but then wasn't able to fulfill it. But the person who makes a promise and is able to fulfill it, but then doesn't, that's very frustrating. And if God was able to keep all of his promises, but then chose not to, that would be very discouraging. But listen, God is not only able to keep his promises, but he's going to keep his promises. Therefore, rather than stewing over the broken promises that, people have made to us or rather than wrestling with why God hasn't fulfilled his promises to you in the time frame that you decided, 
I would just point out that these focuses are, are all wrong and they will send you drifting off in all the wrong directions. And with that, I would conclude our study this morning by redirecting your attention back to where it belongs. I want to refocus your mind on the one who has given us permanent promises which will never be broken. With that, I would direct your attention back to the fact that the infallibility of God's permanent promises will fill our hearts with patience. Because as we grasp the infallibility of God's permanent promises, we recognize that his promises are free of error. And because they are free of error, then we can endure every hardship as we look forward to the day when every promise will be fulfilled. I would also encourage you to focus on the immutability of God's permanent promises, which should fill our hearts with great confidence. And as we consider the immutability of God's promises, we recognize that his promises will never change. He's not going to promise one thing one day and then change his mind and promise something different the next day. No, we can simply rest in the fact that the Lord will always keep his promises and he will never change the promises that he's made. Finally, I would encourage you to Focus your attention on the immovability of God's permanent promises because the immovability of God's permanent promises will fill our hearts with assurance. And his promises provide us with hope and that hope becomes an immovable anchor for our souls. The hope of our salvation will become like an anchor for our souls and it will help us to stand fast in the salvation of our Savior Jesus. And so with that, I encourage you, fix your focus on the permanent promises of God, which are fulfilled in Christ Jesus.